Please open your Bibles to John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And as you turn there, I'll remind you that we are nearing the completion of our study of this section, a chapter and a half of John's Gospel. Uh, one of my favorite sections in John's Gospel. Uh, the vision of our Lord as the Good Shepherd I find so glorious and encouraging. And I'll remind you that chapter 9 is made up of the account of the healing of the man born blind, his subsequent interrogation, his excommunication, and then being found by Jesus, brought to faith. He worships him out in public, in the street presumably. And then at the end of chapter 9, Jesus speaks not just of his mission to save and give sight to the blind, but also a mission of judgment, a mission of blinding those who presume to say they can see. And some Pharisees standing by say, are you talking about us? And chapter 10 makes it clear, yes, he is. Yes, yes, indeed, he is talking about them. So I'd like to read with you uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. Actually, go up one day, 21. And we'll be studying the middle of this chunk. God willing, next week we'll finish this chunk. In Jesus' response to the Pharisees who said, are you, are you talking about us? <clears throat> John chapter 10, verses 1 through 21. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill, to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also. And they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. There was again the division among the Jews because of these words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? Others said, these are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray. Lord God, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. And for those of us who do already have eyes to see, open them wider, remove whatever cobwebs, whatever veil may be blocking our vision, unify our hearts to fear your name. Let us attend to your word and the glory of your son revealed here. Let us see our shepherd as the good shepherd. Let us know our Lord as the door of the sheep. And let us know the salvation and the pasture and the safety that he offers. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So this Good shepherd discourse, it's one way to des describe it, has three chunks. We've looked at the first chunk, and I think we can see divisions in the text for the chunks. In the first five verses, with the conclusion in verse six, Jesus is using a shepherding metaphor in the third person. He's talking about the shepherd of the sheep, not I 
and me, first person. So the first illustration is in third person. And then we're told that the, the Pharisees didn't understand. It went over their heads. So then Jesus starts again. And, and the metaphor shifts a little bit, but the central points remain the same. Now he's speaking more plainly, eyes and me's. And, and continuing is this contrast between the good shepherd, who Jesus is, and these other people. In the first five verses, the contrast is between the shepherd of the sheep, who is an authorized agent. He enters through the gate. The gatekeeper recognizes him. And so clearly, he has the right, he has the authority to shepherd, versus the people who climb over the wall, who are thieves and robbers. The second, so in the first contrast, Jesus is authorized... They are not. In the second contrast, Jesus knows and is known by his sheep, and they are not. And the central point there is no longer on how you enter the sheepfold, but on the voice, the voice that the sheep recognize, the voice that the sheep flee from. Those are the two big contrasts between Jesus and the Pharisees, Jesus and the other would-be shepherds. Now, today's study is centered around two I am statements. John's gospel famously has about seven separate I am statements. We've already seen one or two. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. We're going to get some more in chapter 10. I am the way, the truth, and the life. But today, the two that we'll be considering is Jesus saying, I am the door of the sheep. He says it twice, once in verse 7 and once in verse 9. And then, I am the good shepherd. And he says that twice, but we're just looking at the first one today. Because starting in verse 14 through the end, it's no longer Jesus contrasting himself with false shepherds, but Jesus' father comes into view. And it's Jesus' relationship and his authorization with his father that is central. How will the sheep know him and he know them? It'll be similar to how the father knows him. Why does the father love him? Because he lays down his life. And Jesus ends this charge I have received from my father. The one who has authorized Jesus for this mission is none other than God the father. So in the first chunk, Jesus is speaking in third person, goes over their heads. And then as he speaks again, the chunk we're looking on today continues the contrast between Jesus and the Pharisees. Jesus as the good shepherd and other lesser and inferior shepherds. And then the final section the, the false shepherds, the hirelings drop out, and we only hear about Jesus, his father, and his flock. Okay, and that's what we'll be looking at next week, God willing. So today, we're continuing this contrast as we look at Jesus, the good shepherd, and the door of the sheep. So let's begin by reading verses 7 through 10 and considering what does it mean when Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, what is Jesus doing here? There's some debate in the commentaries as people read this. Is this a new metaphor? Is this unpacking the old metaphor? Or is this an alteration of the old metaphor? In other words, clearly in one sense, we're using similar topics. We've got sheepfolds, we've got gates, we've got shepherds, we've got sheep. But presumably, and I argued last week in the first metaphor, figure of speech, Jesus was the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus was the one to whom the gatekeeper opens. And he was contrasted with those who didn't come through the gate, who weren't authorized, who weren't recognized, but who instead came in another way and clearly then were thieves and robbers. Now, Jesus doesn't say he's the shepherd. He will do that in our second point. But he says he's the gate. And what is is meant by that? Some have suggested that what's being brought into mind is the picture of a shepherd um, making a pen, potentially out in the wild, and at night lying across the doorway, so becoming the, the, the gate for the sheep. It's possible. It's romantic. It preaches well. But given the current, it can't be explained in the current metaphor because the, the pen that's in view here has a gatekeeper. This is one in town. 
not out in the wild. So even if we adopt the, the romantic picture of a shepherd out in the wild, making a little pen, lying in the gate, which, which may be in view, we have to acknowledge that the metaphor has shifted at least insofar as there's a gatekeeper, there's a pen. The, the Greek literally is the courtyard. We put the pen or the fold. Now we've moved, if we'd go that way, from, from some sort of town or city environment to out in the wilderness. I think it's just possible that Jesus is, is using the same pieces of the metaphor, but he's using them to, to make his point, and he's shifting it around some. Okay, okay, you didn't get that. Okay, let me, let me put it this way. I'm, I'm the gate. Just as the sacrificial system, Jesus is both the high priest offering up the sacrifice. This is the book of Hebrews. Jesus is the high priest offering up the sacrifice. Jesus is the sacrifice being offered. And if you've been in Dave Lample's class, Jesus is the altar the sacrifice is made upon. So is, is Jesus the priest, the sacrifice of the altar? And the answer is yes. So in this metaphor, Jesus is the shepherd. Jesus is also the door. I think it's the easiest way to understand this. Whether you want to picture it as the door because the shepherd's lying down, I, I don't disagree. But the fundamental picture of the door is this. Jesus is making a greater claim. As he speaks more clearly and more plainly, he's actually making a greater claim. In the first illustration, his point was, I'm authorized, you're not. I'm recognized, you're not. In this one, Jesus goes from the authorized agent to the one who does the authorizing. Jesus is the door, and you either get into the fold through him or you don't get in at all. Jesus is the means of entrance. That's a bigger claim. It's a bigger claim. Jesus moves from the authorizing agent to one who, in fact, authorizes And Jesus says this twice, I am the door, because he says it first, the door in relationship to other shepherds. And then when he says it the second time, it's the door in relationship to the sheep. So look look at that. I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to him. So the first, I'm the door statement, the contrasting statement is about the thieves and the robbers. The second time he says it, it's in reference to the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and go in and out and find pasture. So he says it twice. The first time, the door, understanding Jesus is the door in reference to other shepherds. And the second, Jesus is the door in reference to the sheep. So let's, let's consider Jesus as the door in reference to the shepherds. So point A, and, and I think this is however you take this, whether it's the shepherd lying in the gate or whether Jesus is just saying, look, I'm the means of entrance. The point is this. Jesus is the only valid means of accessing the sheepfold. Jesus is the only valid means of accessing the sheepfold. We've already learned, what do you call people who don't go through the door? Thieves. So you got to go through the door to be a shepherd. You got to go through the door to be legit. And Jesus says, I am that door. I am the door. You want to get to the sheep? You want access to the sheep? You got to go through Jesus. And that works if you picture the shepherd out. I don't want to rob you of that romantic picture. But the fundamental picture is he's the one you get access through. Which, which at, least, at least means two things. Jesus protects his flock. Does he not? Have we not even just seen him do this? This poor, begging man born blind just receives his sight, is just starting to put things together. And he gets bounced around like a pinball in a pinball machine, interrogated, reviled, and excommunicated, thrown out of the synagogue system, thrown out of the community. And Jesus finds him. Jesus ministers to him. I I love the language. As soon as Jesus hears of this, I mean, you notice the heart of the good shepherd. When Jesus, look look at chapter 9, verse 15. Jesus heard that they'd cast him out. And having found him, it's just, just having found him, it's assumed, of course Jesus is going to find him when he hears this happened. Of course the good shepherd, when he hears of a sheep cast out, is going to find him, when he found him. And he brings him to faith, and he ministers to him, and he gives him the greatest gift of all, salvation. He speaks plainly and reveals who he is to this lost sheep. Jesus protects his flock. We read in Zechariah that the the shepherd that the Lord um, appoints to become a shepherd for the flock doomed to slaughter fights the other shepherds. We we read in Ezekiel, we will read in Ezekiel, that God is against the bad shepherds, the wicked shepherds, and he will will rebuke them and he will fight them. Here Jesus is doing that. He's defending his flock from these wolves. He's defending this man. Jesus protects his flock. 
And point two, all legitimate shepherds enter through him. All legitimate shepherds enter through him. This is the way the New Testament frames pastoral ministry. Now, there's a number of terms the New Testament gives for the same office. Uh, I would argue that biblically, presbyter, overseer, elder, and pastor shepherd all refer to the same office. You can see that most clearly in Acts 20, where Paul calls upon the Ephesian elders, tells them to shepherd the flock of God among whom God made them overseers. So he tells the elders to act like shepherds because they're overseers. If you want to, if you want to check my math. And so the New Testament understanding of pastor, shepherd, presbyter, overseer is this. Listen to First Peter chapter 5. I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock of God. What are elders supposed to do? They're supposed to shepherd. Why? Because they're pastors. Now, in, in our church polity, you guys call Pastor Daniel and myself the elders who are given to vocational elding, which is a biblical distinction. First Timothy 5 talks about those elders who labor in word and doctrine. Some of us do it vocationally full-time. Others do it on top of their other responsibilities. But we're all doing the same work. We're all doing the same ministry. And so you, you, I know that as our nomenclature, you refer to Daniel and I as pastors, but you could just as rightly speak of Pastor Greg, Pastor Jason. But we're all doing the same work. Some of us are com- devoting more time to it than others, but, but it's difference by degree, not difference of kind. But listen to what Peter says. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, that's where we get the notion of under-shepherds. Under-shepherds. In other words, we're elders, we're shepherds, insofar as Christ has made us shepherds, and as far, insofar and as much as we are organized under him and his greater shepherding, the chief shepherd, in other words. And if, if we were to view ourselves as not part of that hierarchy, as we were to view ourselves as achieving that office from some other means, we would be guilty like these people here. What that means for Jesus and his contemporaries is if these Pharisees do not recognize him as the one sent by God, if they don't recognize him as God's authorizing agent, and that's been part of the conflict in John's gospel. You'll remember they sent people to size up John the Baptist. They sent Nicodemus to size up Jesus. They thought they were the ones who did the authorizing. They thought they were the ones who were the gatekeepers. So God's raised up a prophet out in the wilderness, huh? We'll see about that. Why are you baptizing, John? You got your permits in order? Who do you think you are? Who do you say you are? And they said Nicodemus to Jesus. Well, we know you're a teacher come from God. Tell us more. They they think they're the auditors. They're the ones who approve. And Jesus is saying, just like he said to Nicodemus, it's not not what you think of me. It's what I think of you. What makes you think, Nicodemus, you'd know truth if you saw it? Here, Jesus insists, no, no, he's the door they enter through. And by implication, anyone who legitimately gains access to the fold, anyone who legitimately gains access to the sheep to shepherd them, to feed them, to take them in or out, has to go through Jesus. Or, from the previous example, they are thieves and they are robbers. All legitimate shepherds enter through him. And as the chief shepherd, he organizes the shepherds. At the end of John's gospel, we'll get there in a decade or so. Um, John twenty one seventeen. what does Jesus tell Peter? Jesus said, feed my sheep. The chief shepherd, organizing under shepherds. Part, part of entering through the gate is submitting ourselves to the biblical standards and qualifications for elders. Christ, the great shepherd, has said, Here, here's how you recognize people. And so Jesus is the gate for the shepherds and shepherds that do not submit to Christ, who do not enter through him and his commands and his standards, they are false shepherds. Point B, Jesus says, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. All who have come before Jesus are thieves and liars. Now this is a problematic statement because if you take it as it reads and you take the all at full force, This means every last shepherd is a thief and a liar. Now, that can't be right. That can't be right. Point one, he is not condemning the prophets. He's not condemning David 
as a thief and a liar. He's not condemning Moses. He's already spoken highly of Moses and of Abraham in, in John's gospel. Jesus is not calling them false shepherds. So what, what is he doing? Well, he's doing one of two things. One, he's speaking of an all in a, in a relative near sense. All of these guys around here before me are thieves and robbers. There's another possibility also that Jesus is contrasting those who enter through the door and those who stand before the door, presumably with the door closed. So who are the people who don't go through the door but actually come before the door? That, that's possible as well. They're thieves and robbers. But the contrast here is this. He's speaking about the shepherds not entering through him. The shepherds not entering through him. He's clearly speaking about his contemporaries. It's also possible Jesus is, is chastising anyone who would claim to be as great as he. Anyone else who says they're the gate. Anyone else who claims they are the one who authorizes. They're a thief and a liar. Which again would, would indict the Pharisees who've been doing little else but sizing up and trying to organize and approve or disapprove and decide who they're going to endorse. He is not condemning the prophets, but all shepherds, scare quotes, not entering through him. All shepherds not entering through him. And part of the reason why I say that is he, he makes this statement at the end about these, these, those who came before him. The sheep do not listen to them. So one of the ways that I know he's not talking about David is if you're God's child, you listen to David when you read the Psalms. You listen to David when you read First and Second Samuel. Jesus' sheep listen to David. Jesus' sheep listen to Moses. Jesus' sheep listen to Abraham. So whoever these thieves and liars are, they're people the sheep don't listen to. And we already have seen a connection back in the first parable, the first word picture of who those people are the sheep don't listen to. Look at it. He who enters, verse 2, by the doors, the shepherd of the sheep, to him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he's brought out his own, he goes before them. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow. But they'll flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Well, here's another group of people they do not know the voice of. They don't listen to. So, to summarize this first point, Jesus is the door of the sheep in relationship to shepherds insofar as he protects the sheep from false shepherds. He is the one who authorizes would-be shepherds and those who do not enter through him, the sheep don't listen to. Those who don't enter through him are thieves and liars. And this is a perennial concern of Jesus under shepherds. To turn quickly to Acts 20. Quickly to Acts 20. The Apostle Paul is on his way to Jerusalem to be arrested, handed over, and sent to trial. And on his way to Jerusalem, he assembles the elders at the Ephesian church to exhort them because he has a pastor's heart. Acts 20, verse 25. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent, the blood of you all. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock. He said this to the elders. He's telling the elders to shepherd. In which the Holy Spirit made you overseers. Other translations say presbyters. If you've heard of a Presbyterians, that's where you get this word. One of the titles for elder, pastor, shepherd is presbyter, overseer. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to the flock of God in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained by his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert. Be alert. Paul is concerned about would-be shepherds who don't submit themselves to Christ, who are really wolves. Okay. I am the door of the sheep in relationship to the shepherds. Next, um, Jesus says he is the door of the sheep in relationship to the sheep. And here we read, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he'll be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill 
to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So, two, two points here. Point C. Jesus is the only means of entering for the sheep. This is one to one. The only way to be a shepherd of the flock is to enter through the gate. And here, Jesus says, those who enter are his flock. And, and the point to first observe here is Jesus is making an invitation. Jesus is making an invitation. He's included in his chastisement and rebuke of the Pharisees. It's an open invitation. Anyone else who's hearing, we're presumably in some public place. He's met the man born blind here. He speaks to him. The Pharisees overhear him. Presumably, there's others who can hear as well. And so Jesus, when he speaks this way, whoever, there's an openness of invitation. Up till now, we've heard about how the shepherd relates to his flock, but we've heard nothing of how, how does one enter that flock? How, if you want this shepherd to be your shepherd, how do I become part of his fold? How, how do I get in? Bah, I want, I want in. How do I do it? Well, he tells us here. He tells us here. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. And Jesus speaking and John certainly writing wants the reader to hear and in Jesus' instance, wants the listener to hear that this is an invitation. And this has been going on through John's gospel consistently. John's gospel, we know, is written that you might believe. And again and again and again, we hear things like this. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. John three thirty six: Whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the son shall not see life. John four thirteen: Jesus said to her, the woman at the well, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. John six thirty five. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. John six thirty seven. all that the Father gives me will come to me. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. John 6, 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. John seven thirty seven. on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. John eight twelve. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. John eight fifty one. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. You picking up on this theme? There's, there's this constant ringing open invitation. Hey, anyone who does this, anyone who meets this condition, anyone who drinks, anyone who believes, anyone who hears, anyone who eats, anyone who keeps. And there's this constant ringing invitation, which means if you meet these qualifications, then that's true of you. And you're invited to meet these qualifications. Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees, but he still has time to invite those with ears to hear and eyes to see to come. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. Jesus is making an invitation, and Jesus speaks of the benefits of those who enter along two lines. First, Jesus saves everyone who enters through him. This is easily the most significant and in John's gospel, salvation has been mentioned numerous times. And the salvation is fundamentally salvation from the wrath of God. In John 3, whoever believes is saved. Whoever does not believe is condemned already, but the wrath of God abides, remains on him. The salvation that Jesus offers first and foremost is not salvation from low self-esteem, salvation from poor relationships, but it's salvation from offending God and justly standing under his condemnation. That is the salvation Jesus offers. He accomplishes that by absorbing, receiving the punishment, the wrath for your and my sins on the cross. And Jesus speaks of receiving that gift, is entering through him. Entering through him. Whoever enters through me will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus saves everyone who came through him. That, of course, is why he came in John 5. 
34, he says this, I say these things that you might be saved. He came on a mission of salvation. Now, that's not the only benefit. That's the first and primary benefit. When people talk about Jesus giving, giving other gifts, it's true. You just don't want those to eclipse the central one. The fundamental problem you and I have is a problem with God. Alienation, hostility, rebellion, guilt. We're criminals before his throne. And Jesus came first and foremost to save us from that reality. But that's not all. There's more. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture, which is a wonderful way of speaking of all who enter will find provision and protection. Provision and protection. You take the sheep out to feed them, to give them water. You take the sheep out to to get them some exercise, presumably. And you bring them in for the night to keep them safe from wolves and animals. Whoever enters, Jesus says, gets salvation. And he will provide for them. And he will protect them. He'll provide for them. And he will protect them. Jim sang, there he is, there's Jim. Jim sang so beautifully the arrangement of Psalm 24. Let me read this to you again. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. But let me just pause and make one observation here. Jesus promises provision and protection for his sheep. But the provision and the protection that he provides may not be the provision protection you were expecting remember how this whole encounter started a man was born blind not for his parents sin and not for his sin this man was born blind for the purposes of God and if you were around when that family received the child born blind you would probably weep with the family grieve and mourn and for years you might wonder why why would a good shepherd do this why Why wouldn't the Lord heal this? Why would the Lord give this? And only now, however old this man is, he's old enough to talk, so he's 20, 30, whatever. Only now can we look at it and say, no, this was a good shepherd leading him through that blind valley. Right? So so don't misunderstand this. He will give you what you need. He will lead you out. And he will protect you. But that does not automatically equate to the health, wealth, prosperity, and walking by sight that we always want. He's saying this in a context where for his purposes and his goodness, this man was born blind, lived a life as a beggar, and then it went from there to worse as he's thrown out of the community. Oh, but I am quite confident this man born blind is fully satisfied now with the shepherding of his shepherd. I am quite confident he has no complaints or improvement suggestions to give. But, but bear that in mind. God will give you what you need. He will, he will provide for you with his purposes. Which is why Psalm 24 says, look, it looks to me like we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, but I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to be afraid because if you're leading me here, you're going to be there with me. Okay, we have a lot to say about that, but we got to move on. If I'm going to move on. But I, I do want to pause And just echo Jesus' sentiment here. There's an open invitation even here today, 2,000 years later, if you will enter through Jesus, which is by way of saying, I want to be part of his fold. I want him to be my shepherd. I want him to lead me. I want him to command me. I want him, if need be, to discipline me. I want him to feed me. I want to be his flock. Then you're welcome to enter. Jesus says, none who come to him will be turned away. None. Enter by faith to this good shepherd. Finally, under this first point, um, Jesus contrasts his and the thief's radically different intentions. Radically different intentions. With all this being said, it's easy to see the thief and the door have very different intentions and purposes and consequences for the flock. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
So why the thief came and why Jesus came are very two different, very different purposes. Very different purposes. The thief only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's pretty obvious. What is the guy who creeps into your house at night through the window there to do? And it's not renovate, right? Like, it's, it's a pretty, what, do you, what is the purpose of the person who's sneaking into your house in the middle of the night, climbing over a fence? What's he there to do? He's there to steal. He's there to rob. He's there to destroy. It's obvious. What are the purpose of those shepherds who don't enter through the gate but take upon themselves that responsibility? Presume they're going to ravage the flock. That's the point. All other shepherds than Jesus, this is the end result. And these shepherds don't say that's what they're going to do. They wouldn't get many sheep if they said, here, come and be eaten and devoured. The test is, have they entered through Christ? Have they entered through the gate? Jesus has come, by contrast, that we have life to the full. This is a rich and abundant expression. I came that may have life and have it abundantly. Have it to the full. And again, through John's gospel, time doesn't permit, but Jesus has come that we might have new birth. Jesus has come that we might have living water flowing out of our hearts. He has come as the bread from heaven by which if we eat, we will never die. He has come as the light of the world that we might not walk in darkness. Jesus has come to give us abundance of life. In him was light, and the light was the life of men. The contrast and the purpose of these two leaders could not be more opposite, which leads us then to point two. I am the good shepherd. I gotta move quickly here. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Point eight, the goodness of the good shepherd. I'll move quickly here because next week Jesus picks this back up again, even more fully. The goodness of the good shepherd. First point, by putting the definite article in front, Jesus is not just a good shepherd. He is the good shepherd. And that, those passages we read last week in Ezekiel and Zechariah where God promises, I, I myself will come and shepherd my sheep. I will raise up David. He will shepherd them. Jesus is making a large messianic claim here. Jesus isn't just a good shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And any student of the Old Testament knows the promised coming shepherd. In, in Zechariah, you don't need to turn there, Zechariah 11, the word of the Lord said, thus says the Lord my God, become a shepherd of the flock doomed to be slaughtered. So I became a shepherd of the flock doomed to be slaughtered by the, house, by the sheep traders. And I took two staffs, one I named Favor, the other I named Union, and I tended the sheep. In one month, I destroyed the three shepherds. This is the shepherd who will be sold for 20 pieces of silver. This is the shepherd who will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. No, there's coming a messianic shepherd. And in Ezekiel, even more starkly, it's hard to tell. Is it God himself, Yahweh himself, who will shepherd his flock, or is it David? And the answer, I think, is yes. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares Yahweh God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak. And Jesus says, I am that good shepherd. Huge claim. And the first and fundamental thing that makes him good is that he lays his life down for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. Now, I think in this first instance, it's not entirely clear. Is he saying he risks his life or is he saying he surrenders his life? The, the grammar, you could say both. It becomes clear when he says it a second time, he means lay it down, which then puts him on a par above any other previous shepherd. You remember that when David comes to Saul to fight Goliath and, and Saul thinks he's kind of puny and unimpressive, David says, no, 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 no. David said to Saul, 1 Samuel 17, your servant used to keep sheep for his father and when there came a lion or a bear to take a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered him out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his head and struck him and killed him. So David is an impressive and remarkable and virtuous and brave shepherd because he risks his life for the flock. David had no intention of dying. 
He was striving to remain alive. Presumably as a shepherd, he would be very little use to the flock if he were dead. But David is virtuous because what shepherd is this who is willing to risk his life for the flock? Jesus is making a far greater claim than merely risking his life. It's not entirely clear in this first instance, but when he says it the second time, it becomes unescapable. He is going to lay down his life. He's going to surrender his life for the flock. Which means if you put this in contrast with what he just said, I came that may have life and have it to the full, Jesus lays down his life for the life of the flock. That's what that means. I came that they may have life to the full. I came to lay my life down for them. The way you and I receive full life is through the good shepherd laying down his life. And we'll talk a lot more about that next week. So Jesus makes this huge messianic claim. Jesus is the promised shepherd. And Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. So what makes him so good? Well, to begin with, he's he's the promised one. and, And he is the one who will sacrifice himself and lay down his life. Point B. The apathy of the hired hand. The apathy of the hired hand. And here... The, the, the contrast we've had between strangers, thieves, and robbers, now hired hands. And this doesn't even just have to be wicked people. This can be apathetic shepherds. That he's casting a broader net here to indict more people. We learn four things about the hired hand. Let's just read it real fast. He was a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And it's a clear contrast. The good shepherd lays down his life. The hired hand runs away. And that's the contrast. I mean, in simplest forms. And so Jesus doesn't even have to contrast himself with a wicked shepherd. He just has to contrast himself with an apathetic shepherd, with an uncaring shepherd. The hired hand, four things. He is not a shepherd. He is not a a shepherd. Jesus says it plainly. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd does not own the sheep. The hired hand is not a shepherd. And point two, he does not own the sheep. And because of those two things, the next two things follow. You're not really a shepherd and you don't own the sheep. He abandons the sheep to be devoured. That's what happens. He sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And in one sense, this makes sense. If one of my children had to choose between defending you know, the neighbor's dog and dying or coming home, I'd probably say, come home. Let the dog fend for himself. I mean, as, as simply as it stands, it may be a little embarrassing. It's not wicked. Perhaps if you've been hired particularly to defend the sheep, then it becomes wicked. But the point here is the contrast The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not a shepherd, doesn't own the sheep, and consequently when danger rears his head, he runs. And so one of the marks of of the good shepherd and one of the marks of his legitimate under-shepherds is they're not cowards. They're not man-fearers. He sees the wolf coming and he flees. He abandons the sheep to be devoured, which is precisely the rebuke given to the wicked shepherds in Ezekiel 34. I'll just read one verse. Ezekiel 34, 5. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them so they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. Understand this. Your good shepherd is not like this. We, we sing Amazing Grace. I once was lost, but I've been found. It's not I found him. He found me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. And we learn ultimately the reason he does this, because he's not a shepherd, because they're not his sheep, he cares nothing for the sheep. So flip that backwards. If this is in contrast to the good shepherd, what does that mean? It means the good shepherd is a shepherd. With me so far? 
He does own the sheep. They're his sheep. He calls his own sheep by name. If you're, if you're one of Jesus' sheep, he owns you. He bought you. You're his property. His slave, the New Testament will say. Own it because he's jealous for his property. Delight in it. Rest secured in the fact. He doesn't let his sheep slip through his hand. You're his. You couldn't be in a safer, more secure place. Consequently, he does not abandon the sheep when danger rises up. He fights the shepherds and he walks to the cross and he lays down his life on behalf of his sheep because ultimately he cares very, very much for the sheep. That, that's our good shepherd. I'm going to have a word of prayer then I'm going to lead us in a time of communion. Let me pray. I'll call the men up. Lord God, how good is our shepherd? How great is our shepherd? Lord God, that he goes to face the danger, that he goes and lays down his life on our behalf, that he lays it down to take it up again. Our abundance of life is only made possible through his laying down of life. And as we turn to consider the cross and this bread and this cup, we look closely at the price he paid. In Jesus' name, amen.